Strider, Spirit of Vengeance, in 3D, I think. It's not like it actually particularly showed. Or they, they took advantage of it much at all. Anyway, the Ghost Rider is back, and yeah, he is this time set to defend a child who is wanted by the devil himself. This is briefly established in the very beginning of the film, which, much to the joy of the nostalgia critic, features Cybermonks. It s soon after the opening of this scene, which doesn't really tell us anything other than the fact that there's a kid, a black French priest, and disagreement over the fact, over the idea of being able to defend him or not, until it launches into an action scene. It's one of those great action scenes where it's really disorienting, you don't know who anyone is yet, or what the goal of anyone in the film is, so you get no enjoyment out of it, because you don't know who to root for, and it's so chaotic, you can't tell, you know, you can't figure out any progression in the scene, so, you know, but good waste of a couple of minutes. Anyway, the Black Priest, Moreau, catches up with the Ghost Rider and tells him about the child. He offers Ghost Rider a chance to get his soul back, and the Ghost Rider agrees to go after the boy and his mother. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. On the other side of this good versus evil battle is Kerrigan, I believe his name is, the leader of a bunch of small time, well, small time, a bunch of bad guys, you know. He, I think he's like a gun runner, drug runner, you know, he, he's basically, it's, you know, Hollywood opens the page to what are bad guys and pretty much just jams all those cliches into this one character. And yeah, he has a bunch of guys with him who have guns. And you might think that they are, you know, hired to work for him, you know, as gunmen, but really, they're just fodder for the rider. So yes, we still have that problem from the first movie. The rider has a very easy time of, um, you know, fighting off his enemies, most of the time are fighting off, defeating them with extreme ease. At least this time he does have a little bit more uh, opposition. You know, there's actually, you know, he still seems basically invincible, but at least stuff slows him down this time. And, you know, he doesn't just win every single fight immediately, although it's still pretty close. This was written by, among others, David S. Goyer, and I've come to learn that when it's Goyer, when it's a Goyer script, you have to just hope that it will be good Goyer and not bad Goyer. Because he's written some really good stuff and he's written some real stinkers. And this is unfortunately in the latter category. The plot is really not all that compelling. It is really just barely there. You know, just to stitch some action scenes together, and they're not even all that good action scenes. One positive about this that does deserve mention is that the Ghost Rider is actually cool this time. You know, he does some pretty badass stuff. They redesigned the skull so it doesn't look goofy anymore. And this time, the animation on the movement of the rider is a lot less stiff and very obviously CG than it was the first time around. And yeah, you know, he is pretty badass this time. The attacks he uses are more varied, although he still 
very clearly prefers fire. And yeah, this time his touch can turn anything, or anyone at least, into ash. So, you know, except for when he's attacking someone who has to live until later on in the film. Yeah, the devil is this time portrayed by, I believe it's pronounced Kieran Hines, who, like Peter Fonda, I believe is actually a quite good, you know, actor, and, you know, he, he has gravitas, and I wish he'd brought it. Yeah, I, actually, I think part of it is the writing of the character. The devil in this film is really not that interesting. You know, he, at, at least he's less showy than the Fonda one, but, I don't know, I was more fond of that one. Yeah, sorry. The villains are not very memorable. In fact, the movie is just not memorable. You know, I literally just came back from the theater and I'm already forgetting stuff. And I don't think my short-term memory is that far gone yet. I'd, I'd hope it isn't. The... You know, the, the various cool things that the writer does, and some of the action, you know, the, the death that he spreads, and some of the fights are pretty cool. And, yeah, that's really about what there is of, you know, real positive stuff to the film. And it certainly isn't enough. Also, about the action, in addition to there being too little of it, excuse me, it being generally... I don't know... Uninspired, I guess, is, is a good word for it. Look, all action movies that feature mainly males involved in action are homoerotic. That is not a fact that we can escape. But this one is more homoerotic than a lot of them. There are scenes between, you know, where, where men are fighting and it really looks like they're... like it's foreplay or, or something else. And it's quite distracting. There's less of the kind of, you know, supernatural, other than, you know, on, on the villain side, there's less of the supernatural touch to this film than the first. And it does make a particular difference, really. Yeah. Cage is possibly slightly better acting this time. And everyone else is really not eh, giving in particularly good performances. The dialogue is pretty dull. The music actually mostly isn't bad. It's, you know, it's not my particular style, but, you know, hard rock, it's it's not bad. It just tends to be misplaced in, you know, it, it doesn't fit quite the what's going on all that well. It's not quite Paul W.S. Anderson misfitting music, but it's not good. This is a Neville Dean Taylor production, and yeah, Basically, the two people who brought us both Crank movies and Gamer, and Gamer I haven't actually watched, but I've heard some pretty bad things about it. The Crank movies are actually pretty good if you take them for what they are. This one, you can really tell that what they want to do is Crank. Parts of this very nearly become Crank 3, you know. You've got Cage, you know, stealing meds at one point. He very nearly turns into the rider during this interrogation scene. And it just really feels like he's, you know, 
just about to ask to be you know hooked up to a car battery and juiced up it just it feels really out of place and you know when you actually look at you know you can tell it's a Neville Dean Taylor production you can tell from the the style and some of the humor and yes the you know the peeing fire is in the movie but it's as gratuitous as you might think it is, it might actually be more gratuitous, and just, it literally is a complete throwaway gag. It, it has no real reason to be in there, you know, but, I don't know, I guess some people wanted to see that. Or at least Neville Dean Taylor wanted to put it up on the screen. <sighs> Hardly anyone reacted to it, you know, and I was in a pa packed theater, so... <sighs> You can tell it's them, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the energy of a crank film. And it really doesn't engage and excite in the way the crank does. You know, one thing to note also is that this is a PG-13 Neville Dean Taylor production, and that kind of affects them in, you know, yeah, that really... You know, it's not quite as very obviously PG-13 as other stuff, and they do still do some pretty cool stuff. But yeah, you can you can tell that they want it to go further. I think that pretty well covers what I can say without giving away spoilers. So yeah. You know, it's not bad in all the same ways that the first one was, but it's not good. So, you know, if you watch one Ghost Rider movie, you haven't watched all of them. But you have watch, watched a bad one, regardless of which one you choose. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.